Well, get your Bibles out and go to the Gospel of John, John chapter 1. Started this a couple weeks ago, and we're going to now walk through a couple more verses here in the Gospel of John. We looked last week um, at being a witness for the light, talking about the Word here, talking about Christ being the light. And I asked you, we kind of, are you going to be his witness? And so just as follow up on that, as you think through this last week, how did you do this week? Were you a witness for the light? How bright did you shine this last week in your life? I know for me, just studying these verses and preaching them last week, it it just made me more aware of engaging in the lives of people as I go through my day. It's so easy for us just to kind of be in our little world and not to jump into somebody else's world. But listen, one of the greatest pictures of the gospel that you can give is to jump into somebody else's world because that's what Jesus Christ did for us. And so as you jump into their world, not expecting everybody to all be about you, and, and as you're going to the grocery store, to the, um, to the restaurant, whatever it is, as you jump into their world, ask them how they're doing, you are picturing what the gospel is all about. You might not get to the story of the resurrection and the death of Jesus on the, Christ, uh, on the cross, but listen, you are modeling who Christ is and what he does just by jumping into their world, and I do think that is pleasing to our God. As he jumped into our world and engaged in us, so let us look to do it for others. And so our text today, I, I want to show you this even in a greater light. I think the main statement in these verses this morning, that they're so powerful, it's a statement that if you don't properly understand, then you're going to get confused about the doctrine of Christ. Because this statement is full of grace, of hope, and peace, and that is found in verse 14, and the word became flesh. Let's read our verses together, and let's go ahead and start in verse 1 again, and then we're going to really zero in on verses 14 through 18. It says, in the beginning was the word, the word was with God, and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things were made through him. Without him was not anything made that has been made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light, that all might believe through him. He he was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, his people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believes in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen his glory, glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He comes after me, ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side. He has made him known." That this is God's word for us to obey today. Uh, well, one of the commentators that I like to read or commentary series is the NIV applicational series. And, and he wrote just something on this that just jumped out. And I just kind of want to read out. He summarized uh, these verses here. He says, the prologue to John is not about a message that offers hope, but about the message that is the only hope. It's not about an idea, but a person. The Word became flesh. It tells us that God is intent on communicating with us, not, as about, not about mere concepts. He is intent on communicating about himself. The Word became flesh. It tells us that the message is acceptable, is accessible, and not hidden away from mystics and scholars, but was lived in the world and was touched and heard by many. The word became flesh tells us the man Jesus was no mere mortal. He was not an inspired carpenter or a model human. Jesus was God himself. 
taking on the clothing of humanity, embracing it fully and eternally, walking in it, speaking through it, and and delivering the reality of God to the world in a manner never done before. The prologue tells us that something definite has happened in time, something objective and absolute. A marker has been placed in human history And all humanity is now being called to mark time and progress by this post. You see, the Word became flesh. Uh, Today, I'm not telling you about an idea, as he says. I'm telling you about a person. I'm not telling you about a message that offers hope. I'm telling you about the message that offers the only hope. The Word became flesh. Listen, I want to walk through these verses today and unpack these incredible truths, and then at the end, I'll give you the five points on your bolts, and we'll go through those quickly as more application as we walk out. For for John is giving here one of the most beautiful pictures in these verses of the incarnation of Jesus Christ. The, The word incarnation simply means deity becoming flesh. And so on the doctrine of Christ, we must understand properly, if we're going to understand all that John is going to tell us as we read through the Gospel of John, and as we study through the Gospel of John, again, we have to get these verses right, or are you not going to understand the rest of John? Because you're not going to understand what Jesus is doing, or what he's saying, or what he's communicating, if you don't understand who he is, and how John is communicating from the beginning, this is who he is. So, so look, it says, the word became flesh and, and dwelt among us. The, the word uh, among us, he's talking about John, he's talking about himself and those whom Jesus actually walked while he was alive. And he's saying here that the one who created the world, the God himself, dwelt among them. Now, that, that's a big statement, Sometimes we kind of miss that because we think too much uh, like, you know, 21st century Christians when that would have been written here and understand that the Word dwelt among them. John is actually pulling some Old Testament concept here and helping them understand what is taking place and and the significance of this statement. Uh, As we think back, put your Old Testament mind on for a second, jump back. The Israelites, remember they left Egypt and they went to the wilderness. They started to wander around the wilderness because of disobedience. And and while they're in the wilderness though, Moses went up to Mount Sinai. And and it was there that God gave them all these instructions. And and as he came down, they set up a tabernacle. And and in that tabernacle, in Exodus 35 verse 8, it says this, And let them make me a sanctuary or a tabernacle that I may dwell in their midst. There's that word. Exactly as I've shown you concerning the pattern of the tabernacle. And then in verse chapter 40 of Exodus it says this, Then the cloud covered the tent of meetings, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So, so understand in the Old Testament, God dwelt, yes, on the tabernacle. The cloud was there that people could see. This is where God dwelt. He was there in the tabernacle. They would go live in their tents. If they wanted to go where God was, yes, he was there in the tabernacle. You can fast forward a little bit more and you get into Solomon's days and Solomon built the temple and we see the Shekinah glory of God fall on the temple and there in the holies of holies. And again, that's where God was. He dwelt there. And yes, we would go live in our tents, our houses. And if we wanted to go, we would go to where God was because he was in that one location. He dwelt there. But see, John is saying something a little bit different now. John is saying that here he dwelt uh, among us. Listen, that would have blown their mind. What do you mean he dwells among us? He dwells at the temple. He dwells at the tabernacle. That's where he dwells. I, I go there, but now John is communicating. No, he dwell uh, uh, among us. The word became flesh and dwells among us. And then it says, we have seen his glory. Now, what is the glory of God? Well, we kind of throw that out sometimes and we say as you drive off, or the sign as you drive off, so we claim for the good of the city and the glory of God. I mean, what are we talking about when we say the glory of God? Pastor John Piper, he puts it this way, and it's been the best way to help me understand, is the glory of God is when his holiness goes public. You see, it was the cloud in Exodus 
that we read, that we saw, they saw the glory of God as the cloud hovered over the tabernacle. We see, the Bible says, the heavens declare the glory of God. As we look around and see God's handiwork, it is his glory that we see. In Isaiah chapter 6, it says, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. You see, it's when his holiness goes public. And so John is saying now, we are reading that his glory is seen again. We have seen his glory, and it is through his son, Jesus Christ. This is his glory. He is walking among us, John is communicating. He is walking and declaring who he is, that God's glory is being seen, and he is full of grace and truth. Now, we could talk a long time about the balance of of grace and truth because we see both of them here in Jesus Christ as he dwelt among them. He was full of grace and truth. And and so in our lives, we need to model both of these. Now, I I know for some of it's easier for us to lean sometimes towards one or the other. We won't have you raise your hand, but some people lean towards grace a little bit more and some people lean towards the law a little bit more, or Lord towards um, truth a little bit more. And, and, but they're both important. We need to model both of them. And in a church, we need to model both of them. If we just stand on truth, then we're going to get very judgmental and, and legalistic. If we just stand on grace, then we're going to walk unstable and miss holiness. You see, Jesus came full of grace and truth. Now, again, this terminology, again, would have made the Jewish reader think back to the Old Testament. In Exodus 33, because really what what John is doing here is going back and pulling out all these Old Testament concepts as he's writing about the Word becoming flesh. Again, we talked about a couple weeks ago, Yahweh, the Word, it was all through the Old Testament. We're going to see Moses coming up here in verse 17. He's talking about the glory of God. That was all through the Old Testament. And so he's pulling these concepts and even grace and truth pulling from the Old Testament. In Exodus chapter 33, Moses is on the top of Mount Sinai. He's getting the Ten Commandments. And it's there, one of the most incredible chapters, one of my favorite chapters. But at the end of Exodus chapter 33, Moses looks to God as he's having this conversation with God and says, show me your glory. Please show me your glory. Well, God says, there's no way that you can see my face because no one can live and they see that. So he's told him to go stand behind a rock and and his goodness passed by him. It says this in the next chapter, it says, the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him, Moses there, and, and proclaimed the name of the Lord. The Lord passed before him and proclaimed the Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger, abounding, and here it is, steadfast love and faithfulness. Steadfast love, grace, faithfulness, truth. You see, God is the same. God's never changed, and so here you see through the Old Testament this steadfast love of God, but yes, that he is faithful, that he is true, and so you see this all through the Old Testament, and so here John comes in the New Testament and says, let me tell you, the word that has become in flesh that has dwelt among you, the one that you knew, that you read about, that we told you was full of grace, full of love, that was full of faithfulness and truth, yes, this is the one that is walking among you now. He is the one that is there. And he is the one who has become flesh, the Word of God. You can't just look at this text and understand what John is saying and walk away and say that Jesus was a good prophet or just a good person. You can't do that. Because that is not what John is communicating in all this. He is pulling all these concepts from God in the Old Testament and saying this is who Jesus is right now. All these things. And saying this is who he is. Jesus is the Word. The Word became flesh and he was full of grace and truth. Continuing our text, it says, and John bore witness about him. This is speaking here of John the Baptist. John the Baptist bore witness about him and cried out, this was he whom I said, he who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. Now understand, listen, John was born physically on this earth before Jesus was. So what John is saying there is yes, he always has been. (laughs) 
He outranks me because he always has been. If someone went, no, 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 John, you were born first and then Jesus was. No, because Jesus has always been. Then verse 16. For from his fullness we have received grace upon grace. From his fullness, from Jesus Christ's fullness, never lacking, it's constantly full, we receive grace upon grace. Grace. When you think of grace upon grace, I think of something that just continually comes over and over and over again. This last month, I've, uh, we took our, our staff here at the church. We went down to Ohio Pile just to get out of the office and did a staff meeting down there and um, just kind of looked at the falls. And so um, we, we went down. And if you haven't been to Ohio Pile, you've been to the waterfall. Anybody been to that before? Okay, I was like, man, I know it took me eight years to get here, but I hope so. It's really pretty down there. I had a great time. So we, we as a staff went down there, and um, I, I like this picture on the right because you can see Justin debating if he's going to make that leap. And I grabbed my camera really quick because I was really hoping he was going to try, or at least one of them, because you can see Sam kind of look at him, Miguel, going, I don't know. And I, I was ready because I thought I was going to win something America's Funniest Home Videos. I, I didn't. They didn't make the leap. They walked back. But I was really hoping they were going to jump that because it, it would have been a, a great time. Uh, but we went down there and, and walked through, and then um, the couple weeks before that, my family and I went down there. And if you, uh, uh, the waterfalls that come down, it just continually pours over. And my, I guess as I think about this right here, and I think about Jesus, and I think about him being full of, of grace, and, and us receiving grace upon grace, I think about that waterfall because it just means it's continually coming. It never stops. It never ceases. That he is full, and we receive grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace upon grace, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Because that's who he is. Listen, you didn't just receive God's grace at salvation. He is full of it. And he is full and we receive grace upon grace upon grace. It, it, it keeps coming. And then look at verse 17. For the law was given through Moses. And grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. That this is the first time that we see John say Jesus Christ. And we're going to see him now through the rest of the gospel calling this. He's making this transition. He's been calling him the Word. The Word became flesh. The Word dwelt among us. And now he has let, this is who I've been talking about. It is Jesus Christ. And now he's saying, I'm going to tell you about this Savior. I'm going to tell you about this God who walked among us. It is Jesus Christ. Now, I understand that John is not saying that grace and truth was not in the Old Testament with Moses. Okay, that's not what he's trying to communicate here. We, we've already read verses about God's love and his faithfulness, and, and you can find even the words grace and truth in the Old Testament. That, that's not what John is saying, because God gives grace and truth all through the Old Testament. John is here is making this transition, however, from the law of Moses it is now being fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one that fulfills it all. One commentator I read this week said this, that the gospel emphasizes in a series of presentations that the new order fulfills, surpasses, and replaces the old. The wine of the new creation is better than the water which was used in Jewish religion. The new temple supersedes the old. The living water of the Spirit which Jesus imparts is far more superior both to the waters in Jacob's well and to the water which was richly poured out in the temple court at the Feast of Tabernacles. Moses was the mediator of the law. Jesus Christ is not only the mediator, but the embodiment of grace and truth. What God was, the Word was. You see, the word, the baton had been passed now to Jesus Christ, and he is far better. And look at verse 18. No one has ever seen God. The only God 
who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. So Jeremiah, it's kind of confusing. I, I like actually how the NIV says it better. I think it makes sense. And, and it's what John is trying to communicate here. No one has ever seen God, but the one and only Son. So if you have an ESV like I have, when it says the only God there, it, it's talking about Jesus Christ here. So the one and the only Son, who is himself God, and is closest in relationship with the Father, has made him known. He's saying no one has ever seen God, but wait a second. Now Jesus Christ, who is walking this earth, yes, you have seen God because of who he is. He is God in flesh. So John is ending here, putting no doubt in anybody's mind that truly God is in flesh. That's why John in chapter 14, verse 9, says this, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me. You see, he is saying, this is who, we, this is who I am. Do you see who I am? Jesus Christ, I am the Word becoming flesh. So John in this is trying to communicate and show us clearly who Jesus Christ is. So what do we do with these verses? What do we do with these texts? I want to give you four ways to stand on and one way to move as we close out here. Here's the first thing. We stand in awe of the word. We stand in awe of the word. Listen, he came to us. I mean, do you get that? Man, sinful man, the ones that broke the covenant with him over and over again, the ones that lived the adulterous lifestyle against him, the ones that he knew were going to put him on a tree and crucify him. He came and dwelt among them. He did not give up on us. He did not send an angel to come, hey, want someone else go save them. He did not start over. He could have said that, man, you guys messed up. I'm just gonna wipe the world out and I'm gonna start again. Not what he did. He didn't even put some other plan together of, okay, I guess this is gonna take place or this. No, he came in human flesh and dwelt among us. Listen, what a God. Is there any way to show love greater than that? To come and dwell with the ones who rejected you. To love the ones who rejected you. That's what he did. And so we stand in awe of who our God. Listen, if you don't go through these verses and realize what an incredible Savior you have, then I think you're kind of missing them. He has dwelt among us. And then the second thing we stand, we stand receiving and believing the word. I go back and poll verse 12, which was just a couple verses before. It says, but to all who receive and believe his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Listen, remember I said last week to receive him means that there is a giver and a gift. The giver is Jesus Christ and the gift is himself. Have you received him and believed on his name? And again, belief is not just having a head knowledge that, yeah, I know about Jesus, but believing is a repentance and a surrender of who you are. Listen, salvation is not just a head knowledge about, yeah, I believe Jesus is real. No, when we look through the Gospel of John and we understand what the Gospel belief is, it is a complete surrender of your life to Jesus Christ. Why? Because the gift is Him becoming your life. That is the gift. You don't just say, yeah, I believe and I'm just going to kind of take part of Jesus. No, salvation is when He takes over everything. He takes over all of you. It's not just coming to church, it's not being baptized, it's not just praying a prayer. No, it's when you receive the gift which is all of Christ, all of who he is, Colossians 3, when Christ becomes your life. That's what it is. 
And so we stand believing and receiving. Listen, have you believed in Jesus Christ today? I'm not saying you have a head knowledge. Again, do you, have you given your life to him as he has given his life to you? That is what true Christianity, true biblical belief is. Is that taking place in your life? If not, then let it be your prayer today. Listen, give him your life today. Third, we stand filled that we are, we stand filled that we are now the Word's temple. We stand filled that we are now the Word's temple. You say, Jeremiah, what, what do you mean? Let me connect some dots for you. Remember, the Word was in Genesis. And then God dwelt in the tabernacle. And then it says God dwelt in the temple. And then here we see that John says now that God is in flesh and is dwelling on the earth. But Jesus left, the word left, and does not physically dwell on this earth anymore. So where is the word dwelling? Well, we see as we now move to the book of Corinthians that he indwells us. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you. Your body is that tabernacle that he dwells now. 2 Corinthians 6, 9, 16. We are the temple of the living God. Listen, I, I mean, just see, as I walk through the scriptures and you see where God dwells and the importance of where God dwells and what all took place as he dwelt, and to then see that, yes, Jesus Christ, Christ was the embodiment of God, that he was God in flesh as he walked this earth. And so where is the next place that we see that God is dwelling? He is indwelling us. We are his temple. We are his sanctuary now. The spirit of Christ indwells us. And listen, that's not the end. Revelation chapter 21, it says this, behold, the dwelling place of God is now with man. There's a whole nother aspect of God's presence that is going to dwell at the end in Revelation 21 when God makes the new heavens and the new earth that he's going to come and dwell with men. Listen, the dwelling place of God is important. It seems like every step it gets a little bit better from the tabernacle to the temple to the body of Jesus now in us and then someday he's going to dwell with man in the new heavens and the new earth. So, so, Right now, do you believe that he indwells you? Because he does. And knowing that he indwells you, what, what does that statement make you do? I, I guess maybe it should be more of a statement than, than a question. That should make us change our lives. To know that he indwells us. You see, Paul finishes that verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 by saying, glorify God in your body. Glorify God in your body because of who he is, because he indwells you. So glorify him with your body. And then stand humbled that the word's grace never runs out. It, it, it never runs out. Yes, as he indwells us, and remember his grace is coming, grace upon grace upon grace. Well, what is God's grace? I think it's better to describe it. It's like a diamond. There's so many different facets to it. It seems like right when you understand it, you can turn it and you see something else about it. And then you turn it this way and you see something else about it. And so when you think about God's grace, you continually stand amazed at who he is. You see, God's grace was there at our salvation. God's grace is there every step that you take in your life. 2 Corinthians 15, 10 says, By the grace of God, I am what I am. His grace towards me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any other, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was in me. It is God's grace that I am what I am, that I can live. It is God's grace also in hardships and trials. 
Paul says, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. So through trials and hardships and weaknesses, God's grace is there. It is grace upon grace. Listen, what are you going through today? Understand that God's grace is there. His fullness is grace. And then we stand on four things, but we go on one, and that is this. We go beholding His glory as a witness of the Word. Now, please hold on to this. Bear with me. I know it's to me. I don't know if you guys are hot, but I'm getting hot. Maybe it's just the lights. But stay, stay with me. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18, it says we are beholding the glory of the Lord. Again, it, the Spirit of Christ indwells us. The Christ was the glory seen. So we are beholding the glory of the Lord. And we are to be his witnesses like John. As we behold his glory, we show his glory to this world as he uses us as his hands and his feet. And so I guess my my question is, are we being that witness? If the glory of God, if we behold the glory of God, and that is supposed to go public so people can see it as we live our lives, as we walk this earth as we are his hands and feet, then yes, we are beholding the glory of the Lord and as his witness, we are showing the world who he is. And as Matthew 5 says, that we let our light shine and we do good works so that then they see and they give glory to God. As you behold the glory of God in you, (laughs) so I'm telling you, Just sit on that over lunch today and think about it. And then I ask you, how are you letting your light shine? I fear that many will get to heaven someday, and as they stand before God and weep because they realized what they beheld and did nothing with it. I don't want that to be you. The glory of God is supposed to go public. And as we do his kingdom work, it it goes public. When someone tells me that they're a believer, but they're no witness for Christ, that that I have to question it. For, For either they're just being disobedient to the word and not doing what he has said, Or they're just stuck in, as we heard that man last week say, that satanic lullaby that we kind of get stuck in, that we come and live our life, we check the box, but we're not really living for his kingdom. Are they truly not beholding the glory of Jesus Christ because they're not his child? Listen, will you go and be his witness? as you behold the glory of the Lord. Listen, I I can't tell you, I'm not telling you to go because it benefits Reclamation Church. This isn't about us. This is about who He is. I'm letting you know this is who you are. If you sit here today and you say you're a follower of Jesus Christ, Then the Word became flesh. And yes, He died on a cross. He went to a grave. He He rose from the grave. And now as we become His child, yes, He indwells us. We behold the glory of the Lord. And so as we go out and live, we are to live and to show His glory to this world. That is what our life is about. Listen, no one in here is insignificant. You say, that's not, you don't really have that much. No, whatever your job is, at home, at work, at play, listen, when you realize what you are beholding, when you realize who you are, when you call yourself a believer, when you tell that person that you're a Christian, then you are realizing that, yes, I behold the glory of the Lord, and this is what I must show. This is who I am. And so probably either stop telling people you're a Christian unless you're going to live it. That this is 
what it's about. Now, listen, if you sit here today, and maybe you came and you said, Jeremiah, I don't even know if I truly am part of God's family. Listen, I am so glad that you're here. Maybe you have thought that Christianity is just a head knowledge and you prayed a prayer or you were baptized, you know, that saved me. And you're realizing that it is so much more. That it is Christ becoming your life. And maybe you sit here today and you have never done that. You have never given your life to Jesus Christ. You know about Him, but He is not your life then listen, let today be the day of your salvation. You can today repent and give your life to Jesus Christ. Don't wait. I'll be here at the end. I'd love to talk with you. Yeah, you can do it right there in your chair and say, God, here's my life. Will you come and indwell me? And let today be the day that true life begins to live inside of you. Will you bow your head and close your eyes with me? With heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm going to pray here. But before I do, if, if you're here right now and you say, Jeremiah, I do not know if I am part of God's family. You talk about Christianity about beholding the glory of God, about a surrender, and I do not know if that is me. Will you pray for me? I'm not going to embarrass you right now. I'm not going to call you out, but if you're sitting here today and say, Jeremiah, I don't know if I am truly part of God's family, if I am his child. I just, I need prayer right now. Will you just slip your hand up and put it down? Just put it up and put it down. No one else is looking. Thank you. Put it down. Anybody else? Just slip it up and put it down. Say, will you pray for me? Say, Jeremiah, what if the person next to me feels my hand go up? Listen, this is about your eternal destiny with God. Who cares about the person next to you? Maybe that first step is just putting your hand up in the air saying, I don't know if I'm even saved. Just slip your hand up and put it down. It's bowed and eyes closed. Say, Jeremiah, that's me. Anybody else? Just want to slip it up and put it down. Say, can I just, you know, I'll just kind of repeat this little prayer and say, God, if I've never been saved, save me now. Listen, I don't think that's a surrender. I think that's just a, a prayer out of fear. Do you truly believe and have given your life to Christ and ready to change? Now, for some of you, you are saved here. And if you are, then I'm going to ask you, are you being a witness? Maybe you need to go to God right now and say, God, I'm not showing this world. I'm not showing my kids. I'm not showing my neighbors, the people at the grocery store. I'm not being that witness, beholding, as I behold the glory of the Lord to live it out. And maybe right now, you just need to repent and say, God, this is where I'm at. Stand with me as we pray. Father, thank you for your word. Your word that we are called to obey. The spirit will you please work in hearts and lives. Lord, I thank you for every person that is here. I thank you for the life, Lord, you brought them here. I don't think they're here by accident. So God, will you challenge them and change them? Lord, we magnify you, for you are above all. And so, God, if there is someone here who does not know you as the Lord and Savior, God, I pray that they'd come and talk to me, find one of our elders, one of our pastors, and God, let them talk the most important decision they can make. For 
for your glory, God. So God, we magnify you and we pray these things. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Let's close by singing this, that he is above all. Above all else, I adore your name. Above all else, to my heart, to sing your praise above. fight it this week on our knees in prayer. Hope you join us in the prayer time 6.30 in the morning or look for those emails. Be here Wednesday night, Fresh Encounter. And, and as you walk out today, uh, we had a vision meeting this last Sunday night. And, and if you weren't here or you didn't get it online, um, you can pick up one of these. It's a lot of things that we are, um, all the fall schedule, what we're doing with the Bible studies are all in here. Um, I also have some of the praises and some of the things we saw God do uh, last year. It has our, our budget just for this coming year. Uh, also just has, uh, uh, towards the end, just some things that we would like to do uh, and some things that we'd like to do more. If, if God continues to add to the finances and allows us to do more kingdom work, if you're sitting there going, I, I don't know if I you know, believe what they're doing or what are they trying to do, and, and so do I give? Uh, some of this stuff here, what we desire, what God's kind of laying our heart to do is in this. Uh, also, just some of the ministry um, opportunities to be able to serve. It uh, takes about 250 people over three weeks to serve and do all the ministries that we have just on Sunday and Wednesday. And, and our desire is that you serve once every three weeks. We, we don't try to burn anybody out. We don't want to um, kill anybody. So it's like every three weeks you serve once. And, and so I hope that you would jump in. We have about 190 people right now serving on those teams. Uh, we'd love to add the rest so we can continue to, to do that. And so that's all in here. And, and so I hope that you grab one of these. The ushers will have one. These have one per family. But if you didn't get one, make sure you grab one as you walk out. But we're excited about what God's up to, what he's doing. Great anticipation for these coming days, for these months ahead. God's going to work and God's moving in our lives. And I pray that you jump in and say, God, use me. As a beholder of the glory of the Lord, I think God wants to use your life. So let's go out and be on a mission for him this week and know that you are loved.